Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is one of the outstanding elder statesmen of German politics. And here he is, Bernhard Vogel. Thank you very much for joining us today on Talking Germany. It's a pleasure for me. A pleasure for me too, I can tell you. Now, uh, what makes Bernhard Vogel uh, particularly interesting is not just that as a senior member of Germany's conservative Christian Democrat Party, he was able to observe first Helmut Kohl and then Angela Merkel from very close quarters. No, what makes him really unique is that he's the only German politician who's been a leader, someone who's shaped society in both Western and Eastern Germany. And I'm sure it's going to be fascinating to hear what he has to say about the following topics. Man of the old school, Bernhard Vogel has shaped German politics east and west, and he's rubbed up with some very interesting people along the way. Tempting offers in the last two decades, many of the most talented men and women from eastern Germany have gone west. The question now is how to bring them back. And wishy-washy, a growing number of Angela Merkel's conservatives are worried that their party's core message is being watered down. Bernhard Vogel, I could, uh, I could tell that you were listening with great interest to what I was saying in my introduction there. Indeed. And we, yeah, indeed. And we will t we'll talk about conservative politics in just a minute. You've had a long career in politics. It began for you at the beginning of the 1960s. That's when your career took off. And you're still very involved in politics, very close to politics today. So tell me what have been the big changes in German politics during your political lifetime? Die größte Veränderung war das Ende der Ära Adenauer. The biggest changes were the end of the Adenauer era and the shifts in West German policy towards the East under Chancellor Willy Brandt and later Helmut Schmidt. And the biggest of all was the reunification of Germany, which followed in 1989. Great stuff, yeah. So, we're, we're the, and especially German reunification, that's something that you know an awful lot about, and that is something that we will talk about in detail. At, at the same time, it's not, we're not just going to be talking about politics today. We're going to be talking about Germany as a society, as a country, yeah? And you were born back in 1932, so you have seen the country develop over a long period of time. Tell me how Germany has developed as a country, has changed as a country, in the last, especially in the last couple of decades, because that change has been remarkable, hasn't it? The, the entscheidende Einschnitt in meinem Leben überhaupt. The turning point in my life came when Germany was liberated from the Nazis in May 1945. Then came the attempt to create a free democracy. To use this second chance to form a democracy after the failure of the Weimar Republic. The third decisive moment was to accept that, while reunification made us happy, this absolute sovereignty also brought with it a bunch of new responsibilities in Europe and in the world. This is one of the changes that's remained to this day, thank goodness. But it's one that not everyone accepts. Fascinating first impressions there of Bernhard Vogel. Let's take a closer look before we talk about all of that, a lot of stuff there. Let's have a look back at his unique career as a politician. Bernhard Vogel is a veteran Christian democratic politician. Two stints as a state premier. Two times president of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. He's a Roman Catholic. He has left state politics behind him and is well known at the national level. Bernhard Vogel was born in 1932 in Göttingen. His father taught agronomy at the university there. Like Bernhard, his older brother Hans Jochen also went into politics, but as a social democrat. From 1976 until 1988, Bernhard Vogel was Premier of the state of Rheinland-Pfalz. Before that, he had been State Minister for Culture and Education, matters that have always been close to his heart. In 1992, he became State Premier in Thüringen and kept that job for 11 years. 
It was Chancellor Helmut Kohl who had encouraged Pogel to head east. He soon felt at home in the former communist East Germany. He was met there with praise and some criticism. He has a balanced, sober, decent way about him. Just what you'd expect of a statesman. Thuringen is lagging behind. I don't see much progress. A low point came in 1993 when the closure of a mine in Bischofferode could not be averted. More cheerful moments included U.S. President Bill Clinton's visit to Eisenach. Other illustrious visitors included Chinese Premier Li Peng and the Japanese Emperor Akihito. Even before German reunification, Vogel was a frequent visitor to Eastern Europe. It is not our policy to promote relocation to West Germany. But our basic position is that anyone who is German will be welcome if he comes. 2002 saw a mass shooting at a school in Erfurt, a tragedy that called for policy choices at the state level in Thüringen. Our response is not to turn schools into fortresses. We cannot do that and we do not want to do that. Vogel stepped down as premier in 2003 and finally retired from the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in 2009. The foundation, which has close ties to the Christian Democratic Party, celebrated its first half century in 2005 with a ceremony in the old parliament building in Bonn, where Vogel had once served for two years as a CDU parliamentarian. Today, Bernhard Vogel is our guest on Talking Germany. Well, Bernhard Vogel, as we saw in that report, you were born back in 1932. And we today, we know that Germany is a very solid, a very steady democracy. But back then, of course, Germany was a tyranny. It was a dictatorship. What can you tell us about your early memories of that time? My most important sind the bomb of the city Gießen, where I My most vivid lived. memory is the bombing of the city of Gießen, where I was living in December of 1944. It's the experience as the Americans came and for the first time I saw the city lit up at night, not shrouded in darkness. I was 12 years old at the time, and clearly at first I didn't realize what had happened. I only came to understand it fully over the course of the next few years, and in particular when I began studying history, politics and sociology at university. Little by little I came to realize what the Nazis had done. This made me want to help build a new Germany, materially, but more so ideologically. And eventually, I committed myself to doing this. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about being that, being engaged, being committed, you're, talk about, you're talking about going into politics. And your family is very interesting because as we say... Well, tell me, you're shaking your head, yeah? I never chose to become a politician. And I don't think my brother did either. <laughs> but Hans Jochen, who is seven years older than me, came home after two years of military service, all enthused about the chairman of the Social Democrats, Kurt Schumacher. Kurt Schumacher. An incredible man, an incredible figure, Kurt Schumacher. Very incredible. Seven years later, I developed a real interest in politics. Then Konrad Adenauer was the ruling figure. He made such an impression on me that I joined the Christian Democrats, the CDU. Neither my brother nor I gave it much thought. However, later the public was surprised to learn that one of us is a social democrat and the other a Christian democrat. If we hadn't entered politics, our family wouldn't have cared. Okay, so the key to your choice to becoming a conservative was the influence of Konrad Adenauer. Yes, but it was also the influence of Christian social doctrine. Catholic social doctrine and Protestant social ethics, as I worked for a Catholic youth organization. 
Okay, okay. And you, but when we talk about these, Kurt Schumacher, Konrad Adenauer, these huge personalities in the post-war period, a little bit later, one, uh, another very Im important personality here in Germany, obviously, is Helmut Kohl. He was the person that you replaced as chief minister in, uh, in Rheinland-Pfalz, yeah? You know him very well. You have known him down the years very, very well. People outside Germany, they look at Helmut Kohl and they see his role in reunification, very important, but they ask themselves, what kind of man was Helmut Kohl? And you can tell us. Yes. I met Helmut Kohl when we were both students at the University of Heidelberg. And back then, people said he'd become the state premier of Rheinland-Pfalz someday. But no one predicted he'd become German chancellor, and even more, the chancellor who'd reunify East and West Germany. Okay, so, wait, one second. So he had, he had a charisma. Yes, he... He, uh, he had the charisma, yeah. Okay, now then tell me, what were his strengths and what were his weaknesses? Uh, to next, uh, auch bei ihm, he too Eindruck was marked by the end of the war and the, and the need to take part in the reconstruction of a democratic Germany. But Kohl also had genuine leadership capabilities. He could get people to rally around him and achieve common goals. He had a successful career, going from city councillor in Ludwigshafen to chairman of the CDU parliamentary group in Mainz, to state premier of Rheinland-Pfalz and leader of the opposition in Bonn. Then he became German Chancellor. It was due to his charisma, but also his leadership skills. Okay, so he was a born leader. You've given him a very good writer. What were his weaknesses? His close ties to his Christian family, his involvement in the beginning phases of the Christian Democratic Party after 1945. Nach 1945. Yeah, but when I say his weaknesses in German, his Schwächen, what, was, what were the problems with Helmut Kohl? What did he get wrong? Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the problem was that sometimes he didn't like it if you wanted things different than him. Helmut Kohl and I have been friends from our college days until today, but I haven't always done what he wanted. Did he get angry with you? No. Uh, uh, I bet he did. I bet he did. <laughs> I admire Kohl beyond measure, but occasionally I allowed myself to think and decide differently from him. Okay, okay. We're going to talk about East and West Germany now a little bit. Yeah, that's going to be our next topic. And for, uh, for two decades now, uh, it's still a trend here in Germany that a lot of the brightest and the best young people from the states of Eastern Germany have tended to head west to build <coughs> their careers. Now, efforts are underway to try and tempt them back. 33-year-old Stefan Reider has just moved back to his hometown, Erfurt. In Western Germany, he worked for a big software company. His new job in Erfurt is quality management of computer programming. I've been given a new position, project manager. It's a big move up compared to what I was previously doing. Same company. Next example, Susanna Angrik. Susanna worked as an industrial lawyer in the west of the country for four years, but it wasn't just homesickness that brought her back. It wasn't as if I wanted to move back to Thuringen at any cost. I still needed some sort of financial incentive, and I needed to be challenged in my work. That was definitely an important factor in weighing up the benefits. The young professionals both had more opportunities in Western Germany. But more recently, Thüringen's capital, Erfurt, has experienced a turnaround and it's in need of skilled workers. Thüringen is recruiting them on the internet or via some interesting, more unconventional methods, like scouting for potential workers amongst the commuters at railway stations in Frankfurt or Munich. Several hundred people have expressed an interest. What's important for us is to create steady and sustainable growth for Thüringen. And we urgently need qualified workers to do so. 
In 2001, with partial funding from the Economics Ministry, the state of mecklenburg vorpommern founded mv for You. The agency has already persuaded over 1,000 skilled workers to return, with incentives including relocation allowances and daycare for children. Low birth rates in recent years means there's a surplus of positions available to young people, but experts say wages here are still too low. The question is whether the state will become attractive enough for employees and school leavers to remain here. Many young people still think they won't get good jobs in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, but that's changed. Many eastern German cities like Erfurt have been given a facelift, and people are moving back. Stefan Reider is glad he can again live in the same city as his wife after five years of commuting and weekend visits. A happy couple, maybe. Uh, what, what, we have, uh, what we've learned is that a lot of people have been going from the east to the west and that some people, at least, are coming back. And we hear a lot about that. We, we read a lot about it in the newspapers. How strong is that trend, really? It is a ganz natürliche... It's a completely natural development for someone who's unemployed in Thüringen, in eastern Germany, to take a job offer in neighboring Hessen or Bavaria in the west. By the way, there's not just a migration from east to west, but also from north to south, to Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg. You can't stop that by giving rousing speeches. Instead, you have to ensure that the eastern German states become competitive. People are now starting to return to the east because we're starting to become competitive, at least in Thüringen and Saxony. It's interesting that you say that, though, because yes, just yesterday I was reading a major German newspaper and they were talking about a new report that has come out saying that... I remember. Exactly. East Germany, Eastern Germany, yeah. will never reach the level of Western uh, Germany. That's what the report says. Is not allowed. <laughs> you can't compare Eastern and Western Germany so indiscriminately. In Western Germany, the differences between Schleswig-Holstein and Bavaria are at least as big as those between Thüringen and Mecklenburg-Vorpommern. That's why I must contradict this statement. We're going to have states in Eastern Germany that will be very competitive and others that won't be able to compete to the same degree. OK, then let's talk about the state that you know best of all, because you were state premier. In 1992, you went to Turingen in the East after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. So this was a new start for Turing, and It was a completely new economic system had been adopted. What was what, did you, what were your impressions when you arrived there? What, do you, what did you find? What did you see? For me, began 1992 the greatest adventure of my life. The greatest adventure of my life began in 1992, helping to rebuild a German state that was dissolved against the will of its people in 1952. You didn't know where to start because everything from the land registry to the parliament had to be reinstated. It was like being in a huge casualty ward, where you always looked after the biggest emergency next. It's a real adventure. It was the zero hour, the rebirth of states located on the territory of the former East Germany. Okay, so that was then. What is now? 20 years later, where is Thüringen? I never dared to hope that in 20 years' time, Thüringen would look the way it does now. For example, Thüringen's unemployment rate is now comparable with that of North Rhine-Westphalia. When I started, unemployment was over 20% in Thüringen. There's still much to be done. But I'd go so far as to claim that all in all, we've managed to overcome the division of East and West Germany. OK, but you know, and I know, that maybe the, the statistics look pretty good and better than you expected, yeah? But a lot of people in Eastern Germany still feel shut out. <coughs> they feel, they feel as though they're losers and not winners. But that's understandable. After the Berlin Wall fell, three out of four people lost their jobs. Some never found another one. 
The losses were much greater than we'd anticipated. So it's natural that there are people who are disappointed, who got the short end of the stick. But thank goodness their numbers are falling. And in the meantime, a new generation is growing up, and there's a risk that they won't even realize there ever was a wall. Okay, okay. <coughs> so that was that was good news from Thuringen. We've got some bad news from Thuringen yeah. as well. You know, uh, uh, it was in November that the story broke: Re revelations of a of a right wing terrorist cell based in Thuringen that for ten years went on a rampage around Germany. Uh, part of that, ten murders, nine of them racially motivated, as far as we can tell. Um, there are a lot of things you can say about this cruel and, and cold-blooded campaign, but one thing is true, it is very bad news for Thuringen. A terrible news. It's terrible it news. Total it's incomprehensible that, that it could happen konnte, and that no one in Germany, <coughs> in Deutschland, neither in the states where the murders Deutschland, occurred nor in Berlin, sind, ever thought of following uh, the trail left uh, by right-wing extremists. That's shocking and almost impossible to grasp. But it's no reason to start pointing the finger at Turingen just because three of the alleged killers come from there. Instead, there's every reason to say Turingen has prevented right-wing radical MPs from ever sitting in our parliament, unlike other states. <coughs> dass in unserem Parlament je ein rechtsradikaler Abgeordneter gesessen hat, im Gegensatz okay. zu anderen. Yeah. <coughs> nevertheless, <coughs> nevertheless, you would, I mean, imagine, let's say, a Korean computer expert thinking about coming to live and work in Germany at a, at a university <coughs> in Thüringen. And here's that story. You cannot, with a good conscience, say to that person, go and live and work in Thüringen. Uh, it, then he couldn't live in any state in Germany. Something bad happened in Thüringen, but things that are just as bad have occurred in other states too. That's no reason to start pointing the finger at Thüringen. Okay. So it's a broader problem. It's a very serious problem. And it, and it must be addressed. It must be addressed at the highest level yeah, here in Germany. I hope it is. Let's take a break for a second, yeah? We've yeah. been talking about conservative politics here in Germany, uh, and there can be little doubt about the fact that there's a growing groundswell, I think you can call it, a groundswell of discomfort in the ranks of Angela Merkel's conservative <coughs> Christian Democrat party at the moment. People are no longer convinced uh, that although their party is labelled conservative, that's really what it is. West Germany's Christian Democrats, the CDU, were staunchly conservative. Konrad Adenauer, Alfred Dreger, Helmut Kohl, and in their Bavarian sister party, the CSU, Franz Josef Strauss, were all clear about their enemies. We will do everything in our political power to prevent the emergence of a communist Germany in a Marxist Europe. And this is the future of the CDU, members of the Schüler Union, a subsidiary organization of conservative school pupils. These 17 and 18 year olds are dealing with a party that's much less easily definable. I haven't been in the CDU for long, but during my membership it's overturned more of its principles than in the past 20 years. The fact alone that the party is suddenly for introducing a minimum wage, which used to be a mortal sin for us, makes it hard to see a difference between the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats. I think many voters no longer know what the difference is between the two major parties. Many high-profile men associated with the CDU have long since moved on or stepped down. Nowadays, the most highly visible leaders are often women, who represent a more modern approach. Chancellor Angela Merkel's development is closely associated with the changes in her party. Since 2000, when she took office as party leader, the CDU has undergone a radical change. A silent transformation sold as continuity. In Leipzig in 2003, Merkel put the CDU on a neoliberal diet of reforms and cuts. She came across as a radical free market reformer. Es gibt 
There is no alternative. In order to go forwards, we need a clean break. The Conservatives' narrow victory in national elections in 2005 put an end to the neoliberal course. Party strategy dictated forming a grand coalition with the SPD. Under Merkel, the party's family policies and the school system were revamped. Conscription was ended. And even the party's support of nuclear power was overturned. Critics say the new party discipline is based more on opinion surveys than on its traditional values. The image of the conservative parties has become more haphazard. The parties are more concerned about what the majority thinks in a certain situation and then trying to steer a course accordingly. I don't think that's right at all. A party has a soul that keeps it together, its fighting spirit. You go out and fight for your convictions. Now, if you ask CDU members what they're fighting for, they can't give you a proper answer. That's depressing. But the CDU continues to modernize, grumbling but not openly rebelling, as here at the latest party congress in Leipzig in 2011, with positive reinforcement from Chancellor Merkel. That was very interesting. We were just talking about one of the characters that we saw in the report there, a, a leading, a, a very colourful conservative here in Germany, uh, Jörg Schönbaum, uh, who we both know and have spoken to a lot. And he, what he said in that report was that uh, a party has a soul. Yeah. Tell me about the soul of the CDU, of the Christian Democrats in Germany at the moment. Schönbaum is absolutely correct. A party needs a soul, and its members and supporters must be enthusiastic about it. But he also needs to bear in mind that in mainstream political parties, discussions take place, fortunately so, as it demonstrates their vitality. For instance, now there is talk about whether the C, that stands for Christian, belongs in the party name and whether enough attention is being paid to its traditional conservative values and roots. Personally, I've always assumed that we Christian Democrats have Christian, social, liberal and traditionally conservative roots and that none of these roots can be allowed to wither, otherwise the entire tree will wither. Okay, I understand what you're saying, uh, and it's a very interesting sort of panorama of where of conservative politics in Germany at the moment and where you're coming from. I've got a 16-year-old daughter and a 19-year-old son. They're both interested in politics, yeah, and they might join a political party. What would you tell them to win their hearts for your party? Zunächst würde ich sagen, akzeptiert. First, I'd say, accept the mainstream parties. By becoming active in one of the big parties, you can already make the compromises in the voting booth that the small parties would have to make after the election in order to govern. And remember, parties must stand by their platforms, but they must also provide new responses to new challenges. However right they once were, we can't solve today's problems with yesterday's solutions. While remaining faithful out of principle, it's important to have enough pragmatism not to neglect the day's duties and be conservative but not reactionary. Okay, okay, but what, what, where's the, where, where does, uh, you said pragmatism, yeah. yeah? Where does pragmatism stop and opportunism start? Because you know that Angela Merkel, the leader of your party at the moment, has been accused of opportunism by a lot of people. Also, uh, Frau Merkel... Angela Merkel has become Germany's and Europe's most highly regarded politician because she's a leader. She's a, she's a stateswoman. Uh, yes, of course. And the German Chancellor must be a stateswoman or a statesman. Clearly, she is that. She's different than Helmut Kohl was. <coughs> but, but one day, so sorry to interrupt, but, but, but I mean, one day she says uh, nuclear power is the best solution in Germany. <coughs> and a couple of months later, she says we're going to phase out nuclear power altogether. Yeah? One day she says we need a conscription army, and then about three months later she says professional army, no good. 
But not because something occurs to her in the morning that she hadn't thought of the previous night. Rather, it's because the next day brings with it a new situation. The catastrophe in Japan made us rethink things in Germany. The fact that the Bundeswehr now has other duties than it did when Adenauer created it, means that we need to think about whether the military must adapt to fulfill these duties. And Chancellor Merkel is a master when it comes to recognizing these situations. Occasionally, she needs to give us a bit of time to comprehend what's happening and what the consequences are. Mm -hmm. Is it a problem for your party that Angela Merkel is a woman? No, no, not at all. I knew you would say no, but, but, but listen, you've got Angela Merkel. Is, a problem is it a problem for England to have a queen? Yeah. Now let me pursue the German. It's not a problem for England that the queen is the, is the queen. Yeah, the queen is the queen. We don't, we don't uh, yes. discuss how she got and, there. We accept uh, the fact uh, that she's been there for a long Merkel time. Is, uh, yes, Merkel and is Merkel. Merkel is Merkel. Yeah, look, people, <laughs> people in your party, they look at Merkel and they say, OK, we've got Angela Merkel. She's the chancellor. She's the head of our party. And then occasionally there's discussion about another woman popping up in another senior post. <coughs> and then people in your party say, what? Two women? Yeah, good. Uh, that's, uh, uh, is <laughs> All right, it takes some getting used to. But I'd like to point out that the supposedly so conservative CDU was the first party in Germany to let a woman head the German government. Mm-hmm. Just tell me this, because you, I think it's something that will be useful for our viewers, and especially who you are, where you're coming from. Just tell me how important, uh, you know, when you look at a country like Poland or Italy or Spain, then people, people would nod and say, those countries, religion is very important in those societies. I often tell people religion is very important in Germany. I think you would agree with that. People are surprised by that. Also, zunächst is wichtig. First, it's important that Germany abides by the concept of the separation of church and state. Ours is a secular state, not one in which the church and state are intertwined. This separation turns them into partners, not adversaries. The state knows that it lives from values that it can't impose by itself, and the churches play a decisive role in the development of this canon of values, even if they're not allowed to be active in politics. And for, but when we talk about religion, it is interesting what's been going on in, in your conservative CDU party, because it really was originally a pretty much sort of a Catholic Rhineland Southern German party. And there has been, it has been an issue for the party. It's been a question that Angela Merkel is the daughter of an Eastern German Protestant Lutheran pastor that's been talked about an awful lot, as though it's a little bit tricky, difficult for the party. Conrad Adenauer was a visionary. He couldn't have foreseen that a pastor's daughter from Mecklenburg would be his successor. But I'm absolutely sure he'd have voted for Angela Merkel. Because if nothing else, Reunification has made us a bit more northern German and a bit more Protestant. And after three Catholic male chancellors from the CDU, why shouldn't we be able to tolerate a Protestant female chancellor from the CDU? It takes some getting used to, but it's completely self-evident. Okay, okay, point taken. Um, we're, going to, we're going to move on to a completely different subject now. And one thing uh, that Berlin, the German capital, uh, has that might come as a surprise to Bernhard Vogel, but might also warm his heart, because he likes a glass of wine, is the fact that they're, in the capital, <coughs> in the German capital, Berlin, there is a vineyard, that's right, uh, despite the sandy soil in the Brandenburg area and the northern German climate, which really doesn't lend itself to the cultivation of the grape, we have a vineyard here in the city. Uh, and the interesting thing, is it's in the downtown district of Kreuzberg, on the hill, in fact, that the district is named after. Grapes have been grown on Kreuzberg in Berlin since the Middle Ages. Sweet as sugar. Daniel Meyer is the vintner at this urban vineyard. These would make a great ice wine if we had more grapes. Most of the harvest has already been pressed to yield 600 bottles of Pinot Noir and Riesling. 
Daniel Meyer wants to plant more vines and eventually produce a sparkling wine as well. We have a special microclimate because of this huge wall. It reflects the sunlight but also absorbs the heat and then releases it in the evening, which is great for ripening the grapes. A bottle of Kreuzberg wine costs 10 euros. The demand is significant. The taste? Controversial. Sour. Lemony. Terribly dry. Well-integrated acid. Unusual. Absolutely. Totally unusual. Have you tried that wine? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. I was sure you were going to say no, yeah? I don't have anything against people in Berlin and Hamburg producing wine, but they aren't serious competition for Rheinland-Pfalz and Baden-Württemberg. You have very good wines down there in the, in the region. Yes, we make good wine, and in particular, lots of it. Here, Germany can compete well with the rest of the world. We produce very good white wine. And in the, in the region that you come from, what is the... What is, I mean, I know you know your wine. What is, why is the wine so good? Because it's so good. First, it's produced from superior grapes. And secondly, it's made, aged and marketed according to centuries-old winemaking traditions. It's not just about the soil and the sun, but also the experience behind this. Mm -hmm. The culture. Yeah. Uh, if you want the culture. Yeah, exactly. And it's quite important for Rheinland-Pfalz, where you come from, that the, it's quite, uh, a lot of the wine is actually grown quite close to France, to the French border. You actually have a joint border with France. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, uh, to the Elsass, in exactly. the Elsass there is region an influence there. is uh, yeah. a lot of wine, yes. This is one point of the good neighbourhood between both oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. Uh, sides. Yeah. Um, We've talked about Germany as a region, as being a place with lots of different regions, and I think that's very <coughs> fascinating for the viewers, east, west and north, south. You've talked yeah. about that. And also this divide between sort of the Protestant northeast and the Catholic southwest. No. You're nodding vaguely, yeah? It's interesting, uh, we talked about Berlin and the Berlin wine. You, you come from the, the part of Germany where people tend to be very suspicious of Berlin. People tend to look upon Berlin as a sort of a, a decadent place with a difficult political history. What's your take on all that? It was for me no question after the reunification we have to go from Bonn to Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, Berlin was the capital uh, uh, city and uh, we always uh, uh, articulate we must return to Berlin. Mm. And it was totally sure Berlin must be uh, the capital. But there has been a certain change. Moving from the Catholic Rhineland to a Berlin that's largely Protestant, but home to other faiths too. Leaving our small provisional quarters in Bonn and suddenly finding ourselves in a big city. It did change some things, but not the basics. Yeah. I was going to ask you, because here in Germany there are two... People talk, and it's very, very interesting for outsiders. People talk about the Bonn Republic, that was the Republic of the, the post-war years, I suppose, and people talk about the Berlin Republic. Yeah, I don't like to make such differentiations. <laughs> Once a very important book was published called Bonn ist nicht Weimar, or Bonn ist not Weimar, which pointed out the differences between Germany's constitution and that of the Weimar Republic. The move to Berlin didn't change that at all. There have been changes to its outer appearance, but reunification hasn't changed the basis, the foundation of German politics. East Germany collapsed and the East German states joined the Federal Republic of Germany. There's a difference in size and lifestyle, but there's there's no difference in the principles of government. 
OK. The, the three big themes we've talked about today have been conservative politics, have been about Germany's regionalism, east and west, and, and, and we, we've also talked about sort of the economic developments in Germany. I'd just like to come back to your big topic, what interests me most, this east-west thing, where you've been on both sides of the divide <coughs> as a state premier. Are you convinced that the, the German reunification is and will be a success story? Uh, totally sure. It was and it is a success story. But there are problems brought about by the division of Germany which have yet to be solved. But by and large, in 20 years, we've been able to overcome the most painful episode in German history, the division of Germany. And that's something we Germans can be a bit proud of. Great stuff. Uh, let's move on to our quiz at the end of the show, the traditional Talking Germany quiz. <laughs> I give you sort of two um, opposites, more or less, yeah, and you can choose between the two of them. We talked about wine. What do you prefer, red wine or white wine? White wine. <laughs> uh, which is the best German capital, Bonn or Berlin? It was Bonn <laughs> and it is Berlin. <laughs> that was a very that was a that was a politician's answer, yeah. yeah. Your no, it is a, it is a wahre Antwort. <laughs> it's a true answer, an honest answer. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, your Christian Democrat Party is it modern or traditional? Traditional modern. Traditional modern, yeah. What's the traditional bit and what's the modern bit? Quickly, yeah. Traditional modern. It's <laughs> impossible to be modern without tradition. Okay, okay. Uh, Angela Merkel or Helmut Kohl? Who has been the better German Chancellor? Helmut Kohl was the best Chancellor for the reunification. Yeah. Uh, Angela Merkel is the best Chancellor after the reunification. OK, and if me, uh, reporting from Germany, when I tell people about Germany, do I tell the world that Germany is fundamentally a conservative society or a social democratic society? Uh, uh, it is different and the voters Votes different, and the right of the voters to vote different. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Bernhard Vogel has been our guest today. Great guest. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, come back next week. Bye-bye. Cheers. -bye. <laughs>